So uh, Stephen uh, Davies is uh, uh, familiar to some of you uh, as an outstanding birder and bird photographer and very dedicated uh, 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 a chronicler of, of bird life at the Wheaton Branch Stormwater Ponds. Uh, he gave uh, either our first or one of our first uh, online uh, programs last May or June on birds of the Wheaton Branch Stormwater Ponds, all 175 or so species. It's a truly remarkable achievement. Um, he also helped us set up our uh, eBird uh, page and um, the French and the and the, the Sligo Creek Watershed Project. That's the iNaturalist lingo for a local uh, uh, locally designated area to that you can keep track of through iNaturalist. And he set that up for us. Uh, with the boundaries of, of the Slide Creek watershed. And since that was set up, um, we've attracted 878, well, it, it brought in historical observations. And if you include those, plus people who've observed since then, we've had 878 different people submit observations. Total species is 2,323. That's native and non-native. May include some misidentifications, but Anyway, more than 2,300, uh, 900 species of insects. We happen to have several really, really good uh, scientists uh, on uh, in our watershed who document insects. I encourage you to look at those. 873 species of plants, 210 species of mushrooms, 165 species of birds, as well as spiders, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. We're very glad to have Stephen with us today because he is the number one uh, 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 a submitter of observations with uh, 3,867 postings uh, on iNaturalist, 555 species. And like I said, about 150 of those are, are, are birds. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Stephen's professional expertise is biological and it's some kind of, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, intestinal worm, <laughs> uh, but he can clarify that if he feels like it. Uh, but he teaches uh, online quite a bit through the Walter Reed Medical Center. I'm, I'm probably butchering that terribly, but I'm in the right ballpark. I hope Stephen, you'll clarify and uh, tell us what you actually do. And so let's uh, get started. I, uh, I think I may be rejoining to talk a little bit about how to use your cell phone for uh, iNaturalist, uh, Stephen focuses on on cameras, real cameras. Uh, we'll, we'll try to cover all, all the bases during the course of the, of the talk. So I'll turn it over to you, Stephen. Michael, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Yes, you, you were pretty much spot on with all your information. Um, and thank you for the, for the invitation to speak this evening. And thank you all very much for um, showing up to attend. Um, Michael asked me to, to talk about um, iNaturalist, which uh, I've been using, I guess, for a couple of years now, after I sort of discovered it for myself in, in 2019. And I'm, I'm by no means an, an expert in, in the use of this uh, platform. And I know others of you, Michael, and others in the audience probably, likely know as much about this as I do. And so I encourage you please to uh, jump in if you, uh, if I make a mistake or if there was something you'd, you'd like to add. Uh, but what I wanted to do, I guess, with this presentation is sort of give you an overview of, of what exactly iNaturalist is and um, explain to you uh, in sort of brief terms, how you can get involved and participate and submit your own observations and try and make that, it is rel a relatively simple process. And so if you are feeling some inertia um, about that, uh, hopefully we can demystify that process for you and encourage you to, to actually participate for yourselves. And then at the end, I'll um, talk a little bit about how the data that iNaturalist collects is, is actually being used, both at um, a local level. Um, Michael already mentioned the iNaturalist project that we set up uh, to collate 
data on the on the biodiversity of the Sligo Creek watershed, and, I, and I'll, I'll talk about that. And I also mention how uh, data being collected by iNaturalist is actually being used uh, more broadly uh, in the in the scientific arena, being used by conservation biologists um, to actually drive the scientific process forward. Okay, so hopefully you can all see my uh, presentation slides and I should have a little laser pointer floating around. And uh, to start off, I'll just explain what um, iNaturalist is. So iNaturalist uh, resides at, at the URL iNaturalist.org. And this project has, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's a citizen science uh, endeavor that attempts to uh, map and share observations of all life uh, across the entire planet, which sounds um, incredibly ambitious. And I guess it is, but um, as you'll see, it's being highly successful at achieving uh, those goals. Now this project actually got its start. It was the brainchild of a group of masters, of, of bioinformatics master's students at the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, began um, as their master's project in 2008. And as it grew and got bigger, it was eventually taken over by the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. I think that was around uh, 2014. Uh, and then in 2017, uh, the National Geographic Society also got involved as a, a supporter of this project. So two, uh, you know, highly respected organizations that uh, do a tremendous amount for uh, the conservation of biodiversity and that are both near and dear to my heart are involved in supporting um, this endeavor. So it's a uh, publicly freely available citizen science project. Absolutely anybody can get involved and uh, it's all completely free. And currently as it stands now, there are, I think this information is a little out of date. There are over 60 million observations of all forms of life in the iNaturalist um, database. And if you look at a map of where those observations come from, you see that they're very widely distributed across the entire planet. There are some uh, empty spots, the middle of the Sahara and um, the north and northeastern parts of Asia, the center of Greenland and up here in, in Arctic Canada. Uh, but the coverage across the planet is uh, incredible. And those observations represent over 300,000 different species of life, everything from uh, vertebrates, invertebrates, plants, fungi, you name it. Uh, almost every type of living organism on the planet is represented uh, in this database. And there are currently over three and a half million people signed up um, to be part of the, of the iNaturalist project. I understand that around a half of that number have actually contributed uh, data, but that's still an awful lot of people, over, over an, uh, uh, one and a half million contributors to the, to the iNaturalist database. And I think on every, in any given 30-day uh, period, um, almost 150,000 people participate and submit observations. So there's a large number of people uh, participating on a regular basis. So I'm going to talk about, first of all, about how you can actually participate uh, in the iNaturalist project. The first thing that you will need to do is actually create an account. If you want to um, actually submit your own observations, you will need um, an account. You don't actually need an account to to browse the data in iNaturalist, that you can do without submitting any information to them at all. But to create an account, you'll need an email address and uh, a username and a password that you make up. And you'll need to confirm that you're not a robot. 
but once you've done that, you, you'll have an account, and this is, uh, again, completely free. And you can also, for convenience, you can link your iNaturalist account with um, other social media accounts that you might have. I find this uh, quite handy and convenient. I linked my account to my, my Facebook account. So I just log into my iNaturalist account using my Facebook credentials. It makes it really easy and I don't have to remember passwords. And once you've created your account, uh, it creates a, a profile page for you and you can share as much or as little information about yourself uh, as you like here. There's absolutely no requirements uh, to divulge anything. Um, okay, so that's how you create an account. So next I wanted to discuss what actually makes up an, an iNaturalist observation. And and by doing so, explain how you can contribute your own. So, so the vast majority of these almost 60 million observations are actually comprised of photo documentation of the organisms that they're representing. So you basically, you need an, you need an image file, a photograph, a digital image of the organism that you're trying to, to document. And if you, each one of those observations has its own page within the iNaturalist database. And this is just a random um, uh, observation page from within iNaturalist. It happens to be of a wood duck uh, that somebody documented uh, in uh, Georgia, in the state of Georgia uh, in the United States. So there are actually several images as part of this uh, observation. And you could, if this was, if we were looking at the web page live, you could click on any one of these and see the images of this particular specimen. And in addition to the location of the observation, there's also a date and time uh, encoded as part of that record in the database. So you need to start with some sort of photographic evidence of your, of your organism. Now there are various ways of uh, taking that image and creating an observation in the iNaturalist database. The two main ways to do it um, are by using image files that you may have on your computer and um, you can upload the images to iNaturalist using an interface on their, on their web page. And I'll say at the outset, this is how I submit most of my observations is using a web browser on my desktop computer at home. And I upload the images to iNaturalist that way. But there is uh, an alternative method to accomplishing this, one which um, is very popular. I know a lot of people use, and I suspect many of you will want to use too, and that is that you can submit uh, images and observations to iNaturalist using a smartphone. And so I'll, I'll discuss this method, method first using a desktop, and then I'll move on to discussing how you can do the same thing uh, using a smartphone instead. So beginning with the desktop, um, I have my, my image file here in a folder on my desktop. And literally all you need to do is drag that image to the upload page and drop it in here. And then the file is uploaded to the um, to iNaturalist. Now I mentioned that, that the vast majority of those um, 60 million odd observations in iNaturalist are comprised of photos. And that, and that is actually true. However, there are other types of files that iNaturalist will accept as evidence and as the basis of an observation. So the other thing that you can use is a digital audio recording um, of your organism. So things like birds, um, amphibians, insects, things that make noise, you can also document them with sound recordings. And in that instance, you will need um, a, a, an audio file, a digital recording of your organism instead. 
And so some of those 60 million observations are not actually images, they're actually uh, audio recordings. So either one of these uh, will work. Although of course for organisms that don't make any noise, plants and so on, yeah, an, an audio recording is not gonna be very useful. So once you've uploaded, once you've dragged your files into the upload interface, they look like this. They haven't actually been submitted yet because there's additional information that you have to provide as part of the observation. And so with your files uh, sitting in this um, submit page, you see that there's several fields that appear beneath the image. The two that you absolutely have to fill out are a field that indicates the date and time when the observation was made and the field that indicates precisely where the observation was made, a, a, a geographic location, usually uh, defined by GPS coordinates. Now, if you've taken your image, uh, you've taken your photograph using a cell phone, using a smartphone, most smartphones will encode, the, encode these pieces of information in the metadata of the image file when you uh, snap the picture. Most smartphones have GPS capabilities, so they know precisely where they are on the planet at any, any given time. And when you take that picture, that image is, is encoded into the file. And when you drag the file into the upload interface on iNaturalist, the website is smart enough to be able to read that information and define, identify exactly where the, the photo was taken. The same goes for, for the, the time. So when you take an image with your, with, um, your smartphone, the information about the date and time when the photograph was taken is also encoded in the metadata. And iNaturalist can read that information also. Situation becomes a little more complicated if you're using a camera to capture um, photographs like I do. If you have the camera's internal clock set properly, then again, the camera will encode the correct time that the image was captured in the image file. For the, for the location, it it's a little trickier. Um, I actually use a cam. Some cameras do actually have GPS capability and will encode that in the image themselves. Um, my camera actually talks to my um, smartphone via Bluetooth and retrieves the GPS coordinates for every um, photo that it takes and, in and encodes them that way. Now, some files will not have the date or the location um, as part of the uh, files metadata. But the situation is not lost. You can still uh, put this information in yourself if it does happen to be missing. So for example, if you click on the date file, it'll bring, bring this little pop-up menu and you can click on the date and enter the time for when the, for when the photo was taken or when the recording was made. And then if you click on the, on the location field, it'll actually bring up a little map and you can just click on the map to indicate exactly where the, you were uh, when you took the picture. And so you can, in, you can enter the information that way also. Okay. So once you have those bits of information uh, in these fields, you can now hit the submit button. There's a, there's a submit button up here and the, and, the, and the files are submitted to the database. And you're essentially done. But it, it, you, so what I'm saying is that you don't actually even have to provide an identification of what it is that you've observed. If you don't know what it is, you can submit it as unknown. And the way that iNaturalist works um, is that it will eventually, other users will provide you with an identification in, mo in most cases. And I'll discuss in a few slides how that's uh, accomplished. However, it is better if you can to provide some identification, even if you're not sure exactly what species is represented in your image, say for this uh, organism here, we know this is a bird. If we're not sure exactly what kind of bird, we can just enter bird, uh, class 
AVs in here. And that's better than not entering any identification at all, because it, it will help other iNaturalist users to find your observation and provide you with the correct identification. But, so there's a really sort of magical feature to iNaturalist and that it will actually help you to arrive at a correct identification before you submit your image file. So if you click in that species field, you'll notice this pop-up menu that appears. And what happens is that the, the iNaturalist website uses uh, computer vision to analyze the image that you're submitting. It compares that image with other images in its database, and it comes up with a list of suggestions um, that it thinks might be correct in the case of your, in the case of your image. So while this, this image is not great, you, those of you who know birds probably realize, can recognize already that this is actually a northern mockingbird, okay? And if we click in the species uh, field here, you see that the top of the list of suggestions that comes up is in fact northern mockingbird. And in fact, this, this computer vision that the um, programmers of, at iNaturalist have, have developed is incredibly accurate. It just blows my mind. I am I'm not a computer person. I don't understand how they, how they do this, but it is really um, quite remarkable. We notice that's not the only thing it suggests. There's, there's a bunch of other things here as well. Um, now, because I've provided the location where the image was taken, this computer vision will list these, these possibilities in the order that it think is, thinks is most likely based on where the file was acquired, based on where I was. And so Northern Mockingbird uh, is top of that list of suggestions. The other stuff here are things that maybe look similar, but are found in other parts of the world, and so are not really um, likely correct identifications. And so you can just click you know, the, the most likely suggestion, Northern Mockingbird, and that will then populate that field and you can submit. If you're not sure, you can, you can leave your identif identification at a more general level, maybe just at the genus level, sort of hedge your bets uh, and see if you can arrive at a more correct identification later on. If you're unsure, you can actually click on this little view link here and it'll open another browser tab that shows you more information about that species. And so in the case of uh, Northern Mockingbird, it opens a page. This is the iNaturalist, iNaturalist page for the species Northern Mockingbird. And there's a bunch more photos here that I can look at to compare with my image to see if I think that um, suggested identification is correct. One of the things that's also on this page is this map down here, which looks like this, which shows you where other observers have uh, seen this species. And so that also gives you confidence that you're actually making a correct identification. If you still weren't sure and you wanted to consider whether maybe some of these other options might be the correct identification, you can look at the species pages for those species too. So for example, the next, I, I know this is not a common chaffinch. I grew up with those in my parents' backyard in Wales. So I'm, I'm pretty confident it's not that. What about this other mockingbird down here? So if, if we click on the view page, this is the species paid page for white banded mockingbird. It doesn't look quite right. If we look at the map, we see that this is actually a South American species. Okay, so that's much less likely of being the correct uh, identification. So all of these um, additional resources can help you confidently arrive um, at the correct identification. Okay, so I selected Northern Mockingbird, and now all I will have to do is, is hit the submit button up here, and the observation is uploaded to iNaturalist, and it now has its own page for this observation. Now you notice that at the top here, it has the identification that I gave 
to this observation. But it has this little yellow flag next to the, the name up here that says needs ID. Um, identification in iNaturalist requires a community consensus in order for the identification to be considered valid. And so this observation now is just waiting for other iNaturalist users to come along and either agree or disagree with my identification. So this is an observation I submitted uh, a couple of days ago. And um, about three minutes after I had submitted it, somebody else came along and there's, if, if they had logged in as somebody other than me, they would see an agree button here next to my identification. And they click on that. And now there's a consensus of two identifications in favor of this identification of Northern Mocking. And so now there's consensus over the identification and it, this little flag up here changes to research grade, which means that it's been, that the identification has been verified by other iNaturalist users. Okay. Now, um, there's kind of a, a sort of a running joke uh, amongst iNaturalist users about how quickly or slowly some of these identifications are um, confirmed. For, for popular species like, like birds, uh, as you just saw, uh, identifications can be confirmed extremely quickly within a matter of minutes. But there are other organisms that can take longer. I would say that this is a little unfair and that um, organisms like mammals, reptiles, uh, amphibians, there's lots of people, lots of iNaturalist users out there enthusiastic about these taxa. And, and those observations also get confirmed very quickly. Um, however, I, I will say that this is fairly accurate. I have some fungus observations that um, have sort of been languishing in a needs identification state for a long time. And I think that's perhaps more reflective of the fact that actually some fungi are actually really hard to, to identify. And maybe I didn't provide uh, the optimal photographs for confirming an identification. Now with that Northern Mockingbird observation I just showed you, um, I just had the one photograph. That, that bird wasn't terribly cooperative. It, I, I did get some other photographs, but it flew off shortly after that picture was taken and the other pictures didn't really add anything to the identification. And so it wasn't really worth submitting anything more than that one image. However, with, with subjects that are more cooperative, I'm thinking particularly of um, plants, where you have more of an opportunity to document your specimen in greater detail, it's certainly to your advantage to take multiple photographs. Here's an example of a, a, a common persimmon tree that I photographed a while ago. I got some pictures of the leaves and some fruit and, and even um, of the bark. And it's good to document all of these different aspects of your specimen because it can facilitate uh, a more accurate identification down the road. Now, if I want to, because these images, well, these are different images, but actually of the same organism, all right? And so what I should do is combine these into a single observation rather than submit them as separate observations. And there's a way to do that. You simply uh, click on both of them, hold the shift key down and highlight both and then there's a, a little button up here you can press combine that will now combine those two images into a, into a single observation like this. So you're not overly duplicating observations in the, in the iNaturalist database. Now this observation is quite simple, it's just two images. For some organisms, um, I'm thinking particularly flowering plants, you may want to add you know, multiple images, maybe flowers, leaves, uh, the entire plant, maybe even a photograph of where the plant uh, is growing. Is it next to a stream? Is it in the forest? You know, all those kinds of uh, information can, can actually be very helpful in arriving at a correct identification. Anyway, here's that what, that, what that observation looked like once it was uploaded with the, with the two images um, as part of a single observation. 
So that's how you upload images via um, the desktop browser. Now I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about how you can do the same thing directly from your from your smartphone without having to use uh, a computer whatsoever. And I know this is this is highly popular with a lot of iNaturalist users. So there's an an iNaturalist app that's available both for um, iPhones and for Android phones. This happens to be, I use a, a, an iPhone, so this is the uh, what it looks like in the um, Apple App Store. You can just download this uh, onto your smartphone and set up your account uh, in the application. Uh, and then it connects with your iNaturalist account. You can review previous observations that you've submitted uh, through either method, either the desktop or the smartphone, they'll all appear here. And the way that you submit observations with the, with the phone is to, um, is to tap on this icon in the toolbar at the bottom here, the observe button with the camera. And what that does is connect the app with your smartphone's uh, camera. Not only with the camera, but also with your, with your phone's camera roll. So you can use the app to take new images of something that you've just found, or you can even pull up um, images that you've taken previously and that are already on your phone and select those instead, either, either is an option. So this is an example of uh, some fungus that I documented this way. I got some images uh, of the top side of these uh, bracket fungi growing on the side of this uh, downed piece of wood. I also turned it over and got some photographs of the underside to try and um, document these specimens uh, as thoroughly as possible. So I have three images selected as all part of the one observation. Uh, and then those are loaded in here. Uh, again, very similar to the, um, to the desktop interface, three images with the, the various information about the date and time and the geographic location listed here. And then th this is the equivalent of the species name box, the identification. And again, tapping on this activates that um, computer vision process that I described earlier and pulls up a bunch of potential identifications for your specimen based on the computer vision's analysis of the images that you've provided. So there are several options here, all um, recorded in the vicinity of where the images were taken. So I happened to, to choose the top one. I thought this was probably most likely false turkey tail. So I selected that as the identification and um, it's uploaded to the iNaturalist database. And again, relatively quickly, several other iNaturalist users confirmed my initial identification of false ticket. And so this is now a research grade observation in the database. Uh, Stephen, if I could ask yeah. you to go back one, a couple of slides to where you have, uh, right there. Yeah, so go ahead. On, on the Android, which is what I use. Okay. I, uh, I wonder if it's the same here, I see that the photo on the far left is clicked as default. Now on the Android, you, you uh, click <clears throat> on, you know, on this little circle at the, uh, in the corner of, of the photo and it moves it into the position that the iNaturalist image recognition system will focus on. In other words, it doesn't analyze, let's say you have six photos, which I often do. It won't analyze all six. It will analyze the one you put in the first position. And I find it's very handy if you're in doubt, you can click on a different photo. It moves it into the primary position. And then the iNatural system analyzes that perspective, that view, may, perhaps from underneath, in a case of a mushroom, and gives you a different or the same. So if you get, um, say you have a fruit and a flower, well, <laughs> we wouldn't have that, but let's say you have a, a leaf and a bark. You, you put the leaf there and you see what it guesses. 
And then you say, well, I'm going to see if it agrees. So then you click on the bark photo. It moves it over to the prime position. Then it analyzes that picture. Sometimes it's the same. Then you feel it really good. <clears throat> Sometimes it's totally different. And then you are back to the drawing board sort of. But does that <clears throat> also work in the Android system? Yeah, this, so that's an excellent point, Michael. And, and and yes, it is exactly the same in the in the Apple platform. Um, and yeah, thank you for bringing that up because yes, that analyzing each of the different images can um, either help you build a, a consensus as to uh, what the correct identification is, or might make you less certain about the identification and, and may lead you to want to hedge your bets and go for a more general. Um, identification instead. Now there are times when the the computer vision doesn't get you to where you need to be, and I thought it would be helpful to just talk through a situation where that happened for me. And this is totally okay because say so iNaturalist is a community, and the whole point is to get input from other observers who maybe more knowledgeable about a particular group of organisms and can help you to arrive at the correct identification. So a couple of years ago, uh, I was out in the desert in the middle of Namibia and I saw this fearsome looking bug crawling across the ground. I snapped some photos. This happened to be again with my cell phone because that's what I had available at the time. And using the iNaturalist computer vision, the best I could come up with was maybe a member of this particular family of plant bugs. And so I submitted the observation with that identification. However, it wasn't long before somebody who clearly is more knowledgeable about the um, insects of Southern Africa saw my uh, initial identification, realized that it wasn't correct, and suggested an alternative um, identification, that of the millipede assassin. So when I saw this, I could, I could click on the species, go to the species page, look at images of what this other observer was, was suggesting and see that this was actually a much better fit uh, for this organism than what in the identification I had provided initially. And so I was able to change my identification in agreement with hers I thanked her for that. And, and then sure enough, soon afterwards, several other people with interest in this particular group of uh, insects in Southern Africa also agreed with the observation. So we ended up with, over with five um, agreeing identifications uh, that this is in fact a millipede assassin bug and not uh, a member uh, of this family as I had suggested initially. So that for me is like one of the wonderful things about iNaturalist is that it puts you in touch uh, with people who do um, know more about uh, these organisms and can help you identify what it is that you've seen. And I think that's just tremendous. So, okay, so, so hopefully that's cleared up for you how you submit observations to, to iNaturalist. So in the last few slides, I wanted to show you some of the ways in which data submitted to iNaturalist is actually, is actually used. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, with so many observations now in the iNaturalist database, this is becoming a really useful and powerful tool for conservation biologists, uh, for other biologists, for scientists, uh, in general, and as of uh, early this year, there are now over a thousand peer-reviewed scientific publications that have been published using iNaturalist data. And I think that's just a tremendous contribution to the advancement um, of science and, to, and, and the advancement of efforts to convert, to conserve our planet's uh, biodiversity. It's terrific. The other thing that happens with iNaturalist data is that it, it's actually incorporated into a much bigger um, database, which 
I'm, I'm guessing many of you have probably not heard of, um, but there is another um, international collaboration underway called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF. And what GBIF is, is a, is a platform that attempts to collate all sorts of, of biodiversity data. It collects data from citizen science projects like um, iNaturalist and um, eBird, which we've discussed before, but also from all sorts of other sources as well, from um, scientific publications, even from uh, catalogs of museum specimens from as far back as the 18th and 19th centuries. This is all incorporated into this sort of massive uh, database. And this contains uh, over one and a half billion different uh, records now. And uh, this data has formed the basis of almost, a, a numbers a little out of date, of almost 6,000 peer reviewed scientific publications. And papers using uh, GBIF data are now being published uh, at the rate of an average of almost three papers a day. Okay, So a tremendous, tremendously useful database that's being made use of by, um, by conservation biolog biologists, by bioinformaticists. And then there are more local projects uh, that are also using this um, source of bio, um, biodiversity data. You may have heard of the Maryland Biodiversity Project at marylandbiodiversity.com. This was a brainchild of uh, Bill Hubick and Jim Brighton, who started uh, this project in 2012. And it's an attempt to, cat to catalog basically all life, all biodiversity within the state of Maryland and map it onto the USGS uh, uh, quad grid for the state. And since um, some point last year, their main uh, method now of importing new data into uh, the Maryland Biodiversity Project is through iNaturalist. So if you submit iNaturalist observations from anywhere in the state of Maryland, it will eventually get ingested into the Maryland Biodiversity Project. And then there's ways of analyzing. Um, uh, Stephen, just to add one quick thing about Bill Hubick and Jim Brighton. Yeah, if go you, ahead, Michael. If you start posting on iNaturalist, uh, at least for me, and at least for plants, but I mostly post, you will often find yourself corrected or confirmed by Bill Hubick or Jim Brighton. They are super dedicated. <laughs> They are. They are. They're super enthusiastic and very, very knowledgeable and a tremendous um, source of expertise. And yes, they've done exactly the same for me, too. It's really wonderful to benefit from that um, knowledge. So there are all sorts of ways of, of analyzing data from right within iNaturalist. Um, and when you go to the iNaturalist page, there are some tabs across the top here. There's one for community. And if you click on that, one of the things that pops up underneath is projects. So there's this, there's this thing called iNaturalist projects, which is basically a way of collating iNaturalist observations based on any sorts of parameters that you're interested in. It can be taxon based. So for example, there's a project here looking at the leaf miners um, of North America, or it can also be, uh, be based on geography or both as in the case of this um, project here because it's leaf miners exclusively um, of North America. Here we have mozzie monitors of Australia, okay? There's all sorts of projects. There are absolutely literally thousands of these that you can uh, join and participate in. And when I discovered iNaturalist uh, a couple of years ago, as, as Michael mentioned, I had for quite some time been um, using eBird to document um, the occurrence of birds at the Wheaton Branch stormwater ponds and the efforts of um, myself and others uh, have amassed a species list now actually of 176 species Michael we added an, uh, uh, a new one last week I saw some tundra swans flying over the ponds 
uh, one afternoon last week. So that um, was a new species for, for that location. So it's very exciting. So in the process of, of you know, doing this, I had also been taking photographs of the various other wildlife that I've observed there over the years that I've been um, going there to study the birds. But I haven't had anything to do with those observations. They've basically just been sitting on my computer. So discovering iNaturalist, I thought, well, why not set up a project to collate all those observations of other types of, of life at the Wheaton Branch stormwater ponds? So I set up a project to do that, and it pulled uh, together observations, not only those of myself, but also now of 28 other iNaturalist users who have been to that location and uh, observed wildlife there. And as it stands uh, right now, these numbers are fresh from yesterday. We have over 4,700 observations of 728 species from 28 different observers. And so one of the major categories is birds, but we've got a lot of other things too, a lot of plants, a lot of insects, uh, arachnids, some reptiles, fish, amphibians, and mammals, and also fungi. So a tremendous number of different uh, organisms documented there. And setting up this project eventually led to a conversation with Michael about setting up a similar project for the, for the Sligo Creek watershed. And so, so that is what we did. And I think Ma Michael already mentioned some of these statistics in um, his introduction that we now have almost 20,000 uh, observations um, in this project now contributed by almost 900 different uh, iNaturalist users. And this is tremendous um, participation, over 2,300 species. I mean, this is, this is awesome. And it's a tremendous uh, window into the biodiversity in our very uh, own neighborhoods. And if you go to the project page, um, you'll, you'll find links to the project uh, from the Friends of Sligo Creek website that link directly into the, um, the Sligo Creek project that I just mentioned. So you can find those there. I also have the, the URL on a, on a slide at the end for you. But this is what a map of the observations look like. So you can see we have good coverage throughout the watershed. There's some, there are some sparse patches down here at the south end that we should probably work on, but um, observations throughout uh, the watershed. And there are ways now of, of slicing and dicing those data to look at um, any kinds of organisms that you might be interested in. So for example, you can just click on, on, on recent observations here, you click on that little arrow and it'll bring up a list of things that have been um, observed just in the last few days. This is amazing, Asian clam, all grass, as well as some birds. Uh, there's my mockingbird that I used an ex as an example uh, earlier on. Somebody saw a red-breasted nuthatch. This is, I mean, it's, it's very cool. You can also um, search the data for things that you might be specifically interested in. So if you click on um, observations, it pulls up a page like this with a search button. And, and clicking here allows you to filter the data using a variety of different uh, parameters. So in this example, I've searched specifically just for observations of, of the monarch butterfly. You see doing that, we have over 100 observations of, of the monarch, again, up and down uh, the watershed. And this includes uh, observations of adult butterflies as well as, as larval stages. You don't have to search specifically for species either. You can you can basically use any taxonomic entity. The uh, iNaturalist database will recognize that. So this is a similar search just for reptiles. Again, we have over 450 observations of 13 different species of reptile, again, up and down uh, the watershed. Uh, this is looking at the data as a map, but you can click on these other options here and see just a list of the different species and how many observations there are of each. And clicking on, on each of these will take you to a list of those specific um, observations. 
And so, yeah, here are the, here are the 13 species of uh, reptiles for which we have uh, records of in the database right here. So, yeah, it's, I, I have found this, I feel, I feel like I learn something every time I, I go to the data and play with it. And it's a constant, and, and, and really there, I, there's no better way for me explaining to you how to sort of play with the, with the data is one thing. There's really no substitute for going to the website yourself and playing with different searches and seeing what things uh, you can find in the data. And I find that I, I learn something new uh, every time and I'm inspired to, to go out and, and look for those things and try and find uh, what other things I can find in, in, our, in our neighborhood. And I think especially over the last 12 months, I think many of you have probably felt uh, similar to me that it's very easy to sort of slip into this rut where you feel like all you're doing is, is literally going from the computer to the couch to bed and back again on this cycle. And I have found iNaturalist to be uh, a great source of um, inspiration to sort of get me out and, and engage with biodiversity uh, in my in my yard, in my neighborhood, and in other places uh, throughout the Sligo Creek watershed, while the opportunity to travel further afield is not um, available to us. And it's inspired me to look at, at different organisms, look for different organisms, and to learn about what might be out there. One of the, one of the things I, I undertook over the last year or two was to force myself to learn more about the moths that were drawn to our house's porch lights uh, in the warmer months of the year. I have to say I knew very little about uh, the moths of North America. I did have a, I do have a field guide to the moths of the Northeastern United States. And honestly, I opened the pages, they all look the same to me. Um, and I find it very difficult to sort of distinguish between them. But I decided to make an effort to document what species were occurring uh, around our house. So I'd go out in the evenings um, with my camera and a flash and snap pictures of them. And with the help of, of iNaturalist and other iNaturalist users, I now have, have documented almost 120 species of moth um, around our house. And it's actually a really fun way to, to spend the evening. These are images of just some of them, these nine different species. It's encouraged me to even up my game. I have some UV lights now that I set up in the backyard. It's a pleasant way to spend the evening, uh, especially in the warmer months to go outside um, and see what's attracted to the lights. I think my neighbors may think I'm a bit crazy. Um, fortunately, nobody's, nobody's called the cops on me yet. And so that's it. And that's pretty much everything I wanted to, to talk to you about. Here are the, the URLs that I I promised you um, the link on the Friends of Sligo Creek webpage uh, that connects to the to the Sligo Creek project, and the URL for the project there, and then the home page for for iNaturalist. So I hope that wasn't um, too confusing. I hopefully uh, maybe dispelled any reservations you might have about using iNaturalist. It really is a play. You cut me off at just the right time, so I'm happy to uh, stick around and answer any questions right. anybody might have. Great. Thank you all for your attention. That's really appreciate fantastic, it. and uh, you know your enthusiasm for it is is is, is evangelical uh, and uh, <laughs> contagious, and will do a lot to inspire people to stick with it, to experiment. You know, to you can encounter stumbling blocks. There's no doubt about it, and. Uh, uh, but it's worth uh, fiddling around and continuing on.